Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming today for Coffee and Conversation. We're very lucky to have Eddie Martucci, a uh, big Y pharmacist, back with us today. If any of you have been doing the Coffee and Conversations on Zoom during the pandemic, Eddie had joined us a couple of times to kind of keep us up to date on what was going on with the virus and the vaccines. So he's here today to talk about what the future holds. And I, for one, hope he has some inside information. <laughs> Thanks, Eddie. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you very much for putting this together. Thank you to all the crew and everybody at the Council on Aging. It's great to be here. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Eddie Martucci. I am the pharmacy manager at the Walpole Big Y. Um, just a little background on me. I did get my pharmacy degree from the University of Connecticut many years ago. I've been practicing retail pharmacy for 39 years now. Uh, in the grocery store setting for the last 11, I owned my own pharmacy for more than a decade in Connecticut, and we did different things. So we're going to talk today about COVID-19 vaccine, what the future holds. Um, and while that nice, pretty screen is up there, I can just tell you I want to do a little background about the COVID-19. I don't know. Do you, do you guys need the mic or no? Yeah, we do for the thing. Sorry, Carl. You see, you're not really the oligarch here. Otherwise, you would demand that I get rid of the mic. The, um, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, started in, in December of 2019, and it started out as an outbreak, and normally the progression is you have an outbreak, and then you go to an epidemic, and then you go to a pandemic. So by March of 2020, the World Health Organization listed it as a pandemic, a world pandemic. We had uh, a, a, an infection from civet cats uh, and bats to in Wuhan, China, and that's where it came. Uh, a vaccine was available at the end of 2020, and the CDC and FDA put together an emergency use authorization that allowed worldwide, over 4 million deaths. And then in the United States, we've had 36,630,000 deaths. You can see that we are actually a highly technology and have a great healthcare infrastructure. So our death rate is uh, less than what it is worldwide, which is good. The next slide shows us the vaccination rates. And one of the things that uh, this does not point out but I did want to mention is it says fully vaccinated. So those are the people that in the two shot protocol have gotten both of their vaccinations. There are many people who have had and probably another half of a mil, half of a billion people that have had one shot. So that does give you some protection. And the reason I say that is the biggest number to me is that a human can pass to another human a viable COVID-19 virus 80% of the time how it's contacted by respiratory droplets, 80% of the time. After having one vaccination of any of the vaccines, that number goes down to 14%, and that's a huge drop. So that protects our fellow Americans and fellow neighbors, everybody else in the world. So that's another really good reason to get vaccinated, not just for yourself, but for others. But we can see that the, that the vaccination rates are here. Um, let me get out of your way. Uh, there are only five states in the union that have over a 60% vaccination rate. And you can see Massachusetts is number two on the list. Um, New Hampshire is not one of our New England states that fill in, but they're number seven. So they're still doing a very good job. The lowest rates are about 35%. There are certain states that have 35%, and I don't want to point them out in case you came from there and you want to throw something at me. So why might we need a booster shot? That's a really good question. That's one of the things that we're talking about now. There's really two reasons for that. Viral mutations and a decreased vaccination rates globally. Viral mutations are 
what happens every time a virus replicates. Every time a virus replicates, it changes just a little bit. And to illustrate that, you can see this is part of a DNA double-strand helix. And of the 30 different amino acids that are shown by the different colored bars, you see that a replication of just one of those amino acid changes is what happened. So that's what a viral replication changes your mutations of the virus. Um, and they do that to become better in, the in their environment. They want to survive like we did, like we change when from generation to generation. So the definition of a generation is that it's the time between two identical and successive stages in an organism's life cycle. So for humans, our life cycle is about 80 years. Women live longer. That's why it's 80, because men don't live that long. Uh, our viral life cycle is about two days, so that you can see that a generation in humans averages out to be about 22 years, depending on what generation we're talking about. My generation liked to spread that out. We only had children every three or four years, whereas now we're back to when I had five brothers and sisters. So now we're back to people having their children, four children in five years or six years. But a viral generation is only 12 hours. So that means it changes. It replicates every 12 hours. So in the course of a week, it could change eight times. And just as another illustration for that, a human generation is going from a woman being pregnant and then her offspring being pregnant. And I changed the colors and the sizes a little bit just to show that we do change even as, as people. And I have three children. We use the same DNA for all three of those children. Uh, my wife gave half and I gave half and they don't look anything alike. So everything changes. And the one that we planned is the biggest pain in the butt. Oh, never mind. This slide shows that um, the viral life cycle. So it just tells us what happens when a virus comes on. Yeah, I think it's pretty cool because virus really do look like that. They look like the moon landing unit. So I wonder if they, um, if that's where they got that design from. But actually it lands on there so they have to do an attachment to the cell membrane. Most times cell membranes are very sticky so it's hard for them to attach. But they have an attachment to that. Then they penetrate the cell. They inject their RNA and DNA into the, our human cell our own biomechanical mechanisms make more of their viral DNA and RNA. Uh, then they mature and then they uh, lyse the cell. They break that cell open so they can float around in our bloodstream and get attached to some more cells. How do we fight viruses? In my world, which is the drug world, my world we do it by disrupting the attachment of the virus to the cell. We can do that by either increasing the cell's defense mechanisms, making it a little more sticky, giving a boost to our immune system, or we can change how the virus looks at the cell. We prevent entry, and then we can alter the viral DNA. So we either have the viral DNA change so that it can't multiply, or that it doesn't multiply correctly. It doesn't get to maturation. Vaccines work by helping our bodies make antibodies. So what we normally do in a vaccine is we have either the whole virus or part of the virus. We have our own immune system build part of that to fight that off so that when we see that real virus that comes in, our body says, oh, I know what this is, and I know how to fight this. But viruses are smart. They change. They put on disguises. So they ask the antibody, who am I? Do you really want me? Do you really want to fight me? So we have to get better at that. And that's where we come leading into the different variants. And you can see that here in the United States, those are the four main variants that have shown um, themselves in the last year and, and about the last eight months probably. Uh, I see Brazil has one, South Africa, the United Kingdom, and then the, the Delta variant that everybody's talking about that came from India. Now the designations with the letters and the dots and the numbers has to do with where it changed on the original DNA of the COVID-19 SARS-CoV-2 virus. So I don't know exactly what amino acid changed on that, but that's what the designations are. Big Pharma, and there's a picture of Pfizer, and no, they did not pay me, that's a disclosure, they didn't pay me to put their, their flag up there backwards. Um, Big Pharma is working on vaccines for the variants as we speak. They've been working for a long time. 
And the University of Virginia has some new developing technology for vaccine manufacture, which is really interesting. What they're doing is they're synthesizing a DNA vaccine that actually instructs our immune system how to fight the virus directly at its weakest point. It's kind of like a blueprint for destruction. And the way that they're doing this um, manufacturing and developing of this new technology, it's able to do it in a fermentation tank like you do a beer. So they grow it out with E. coli just like they do human insulin, and then they spin off the bacteria. It's a very easy process. You can multiply large, you can manufacture large amounts of vaccine very quickly, and storage is a lot easier. And the storage of the vaccines was a big problem, as you remember, from the Pfizer vaccine when it first came out. That was the very first one that came out in December. And you had to store it at minus 70 degrees uh, in a freezer. So you had to have a special freezer for that. Since then, things have changed. Every time you have something new that happens very quickly, and, and the, the vaccine for COVID-19 happened very quickly. It started in March of 2021. Uh, of 2020, I apologize. And then by December of 2020, you had a vaccine. So that's nine months. Previously, four years was the shortest time frame, and that was the mumps vaccine. It wasn't really that short a time frame since the second um, MERS virus in Saudi Arabia in 2012. They've been working in the Middle East to find a vaccine for coronaviruses. So it's been a little bit, a little while, but they hadn't worked real hard on it until we had this outbreak. So that's the really neat thing about this. If this comes to fruition, we can multiply, we can manufacture large amounts of vaccine very quickly. We'll, we'll circle back to the two reasons for having a, um, a booster shot, maybe. We might need one. Mutations again and lower vaccine rates. And the reason I brought this slide again is because they are actually intertwined. They circle back one to the other. Mutations happen when viruses replicate, they cause variants, uh, and it may decrease the vaccine's effectiveness. Now, even when you get your COVID-19 vaccine, if you got it early, January, February, when you were allowed to get that, being that you've been on this planet longer than I have, um, we, can, we can see that you have immunity to that. Does that protect you against a variant? That's one of the questions that always comes up, and it does. Does it mean you may not get sick? No, you could get the virus and you could get sick, but you probably won't get seriously ill. So that's wh why it's really good to get vaccinated. But then when we talk about the lower vaccine rates globally, they're caused by the ineffective infrastructure that those countries have and maybe um, their technology, maybe their economic situations, maybe their religious beliefs, and maybe the availability that they have it. Um, and that causes more mutations, which causes more variants. So that's why it's really good for us as a human race to have the whole world get vaccinated. We want to vaccinate everybody. That brings me to herd immunity. And it has nothing to do with buffalo, but that's a really nice picture. So I put it up there. Herd immunity, by definition, is a, um, is a form of indirect protection against a pathogen, either from vaccination, from getting the disease and overcoming it, or from a mother passing it to a child during nursing, uh, that protects people who are not vaccinated. And you have to have a certain number uh, for vaccination. Every pathogen, every virus, uh, measles, mumps, rubella, all of those have their own herd immunity numbers. For COVID-19, the herd immunity number for SARS-CoV-2 is 83 to 86%. So with a population on this planet last week of 7,874,965, we um, need to get to 85%. We need 6.7 billion people vaccinated. As you saw on the first slide, only 1.12 billion people were fully vaccinated worldwide. That's 14%. So we're way below where we need to be to prevent and eradicate this COVID virus. How do we stay safe? This is the way we stay safe, our new normal. We wear masks when we go into large groups. As I mentioned earlier before we started the filming, that our company, Big Y, is strongly recommending now that all employees wear masks. 
whether you're vaccinated or not. Um, and I think we might have to go back to that. Physical distancing, they call it social distancing. I don't like that word because I think we're social animals. We need other people. We need to be together. So I say physical distancing of six feet. That's a good thing. Sanitizing and getting your vaccines. Now, anecdotally, as I was talking up front to uh, Debbie and Carrie and Sherry out there when I first got here, in a typical year of our pharmacy from December of any year to March of the following year, we normally will sell you know, between four and five dozen z packs It's an antibiotic used for respiratory infections. I sold seven this year. So this, these policies work. They really work. We had a new word that we can add or a new phrase we can now add to Webster's Dictionary called respiratory etiquette. It's a nice sounding word, a lot of letters. They want you to sneeze into your elbow, wear a face mask in large groups, and don't touch your face. When I was growing up, that was being considerate. And if I was not being considerate in any of those reasons, my father's hand gently tapped the back of my head. Personally, I don't think we should have handshakes anymore. I, I just don't. We touch things with the insides of our hands. So we pass those along. We can pass it along. We, I did when I did one of the talks here last time. I don't know if I did it. I, it was probably Zoom, Deb. I think when I did it, um, they can it can live on a surface for three days. So if you don't wash your hands, you can do that. I think maybe we need to go to a fist bump or an elbow bump as our way of greeting nowadays. Again, anecdotally, my mom, who, who's a very social animal, um, got a little bit sick back in March for Easter because my cousins went, my nieces, I'm sorry, my nieces went down, they wanted to introduce, one of them wanted to introduce their new fiance to her, which is great, it's awesome. And she said, well, no, it was family. I said, but mom, they're not in your bubble. They live in South Carolina, you live in Florida, they're not in your regular bubble. So you have to really be careful about that kind of stuff. One of the other questions that they have is, should we have a combo? Um, and uh, Deb, as I told you, I did this earlier for Linda at 8 o'clock this morning. My wife is, is my editor, and I had the Happy Meal up there, and she said she looked at it and said, oh, my gosh, that's disgusting. So I said, okay, we'll put soup and salad. <laughs> and it's true. I mean, the Happy Meal does bring the connotation of a combo to us, but it stays with us for three or four days after we have one. So um, should we have a combo of the regular flu vaccine and a COVID-19 vaccine. Well, it's really too late for this year. We're actually getting our flu vaccines in next week. Um, so it's, it's really a little bit late for that. Uh, and maybe every three or four years, if they feel that the COVID-19 virus or its said variant, the Delta variant, is something that could be viable, then they would do that. Our flu vaccine is coming in. And, and as every year, they change. And I do have the strains because uh, I'm kind of that kind of a guy. Last year, the A strains were a Mekong in Hong Kong from China, uh, B Washington and B Phuket, and this year it's going to be A from Wisconsin, which is kind of a Victoria offshoot. It's in the same vein. Uh, a Cambodia, B is Washington and B is Phuket again for the quadrivalent flu vaccine. Uh, should you get your seasonal flu vaccine since you've been vaccinated? Yes, you absolutely should. Yes, you should do that. Uh, and you can check with me at the store as to when we're going to be running clinics at the store. We're going to do a lot of them. So one of the things that I wanted to talk about was what kind of questions that, that everybody's asking. And these are the most common questions that we have. Um, how long are our antibodies effective for after our vaccination? They're good for at least nine months. Now, the... COVID-19 virus hasn't changed as rapidly as a seasonal flu virus changes. So that's why we get a seasonal flu virus vaccine every single year. Um, the COVID-19 has not. So it doesn't do that. But we're good for at least nine months at full protectiveness. If you had the Pfizer shot, that's 95.1%. If you had the Moderna shot, that's 94.3% with the newest data that just came out last week. Um, where are we at herd immunity? That one to me was so, oh, I skipped number two, didn't I? How effective are our antibodies against uh, variants? Um, they are effective in making sure that we don't get really sick. Uh, you remember that the complications from the COVID-19 
virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, is hospitalization, respiratory depression, uh, needing a respirator. That was one of the issues they had in Italy. If you can remember back reading those terrible news stories about triaging people saying, this person gets a respirator, this person, you're on your own um, to see what happens. So it will protect you from being in that state. But could you be sick? Could you have a fever? Could you feel yucky for a couple of days? You could. Runny nose. If that happens, don't go out. Don't go anywhere. Don't go into your doctor's office. Call them. Let them know. Where are we at herd immunity? I talked about that. Uh, as I wrote these questions first, I realized that was really important to me, so I put a slide in there about it. We're at 14%, which is not really good. We should be higher than that. Will a combo vaccine decrease seasonal flu availability? It certainly will not. That's something that's still going to be made. The seasonal flu is something that is approved for use by the FDA, which means that employers can mandate that you get the shot. Otherwise, you can't work. With the COVID-19 vaccination, it's still under an emergency use authorization, so they can't mandate that you can get it. They can strongly recommend you to get it. They can take um, protocols to make sure that you are staying as safe as possible. They can probably limit what you can do at your job. Um, we do have a professor at one of the college area colleges who did not really believe in the vaccinations, but she had to come and get it because otherwise she wouldn't be able to teach a class of less than 100 people because it was too small of a classroom. She wouldn't be able to have her office opened for students to come for office hours and counseling. Um, and she would ha her ID badge would have a big red X on it to show that she was not vaccinated. So um, uh, she's a history professor, so she was talking about the McCarthyisms of the 50s, which I could relate that it wasn't too much different from that. And how, long, how young can we vaccinate? That's a very interesting point. Uh, the EUA that came out, the emergency use authorization, came out for three and above, although the vaccine manufacturers did not test people that young. Uh, Pfizer's came out originally in December of 2020 at 16 and older. Moderna was 18 and older. J&J &J is 18 and older. They both still are there. Pfizer is now down to 12 and above. And... Um, Moderna actually has done their second stage trials for 12 to 17 year olds, and they have found a 100% protection rate uh, in their second stage trial. So they're going to lobby the uh, FDA to change the EUA for them. Some of the things I did want to talk about with the booster information, the World Health Organization yesterday at five o'clock in the morning, our time, five o'clock in the morning, uh, declared a moratorium on booster shots. Uh, and they wanted to do that because they wanted to make sure that the whole world got vaccines instead of the countries that were wealthiest that could afford to provide a third shot to their population. Now, that being said, uh, our president, Joe Biden's scientific advisors, do say that people over 65 would probably benefit from a third shot. Being a scientist, they absolutely would benefit, but they're politicianal scientists. I'm not one of those. So they would benefit, but again, they want to follow the CDC's recommendations, and we can't do that. I did have two gentlemen already come in to me and say that they would just pay me $100 under the table to give them another shot of something else. Um, and can you get another shot of something else? Can you use a different vaccine? Uh, they don't recommend that, and so I can't do that legally. Uh, and I'm not going to set up on the street corner down at South Main Street to do that. So you can't do that. You won't be able to get that. But there is a little bit of data on that. When AstraZeneca fell through in the United Kingdom, they stopped giving the AstraZeneca. So many people didn't get their AstraZeneca second shot. So they were using either Pfizer or Moderna for the second shot. And they did find that instead of 63% coverage, Two weeks later, they had 75% coverage. So it was a little better. And when we think about that, they were made differently. The Moderna and the Pfizer shots were used messenger RNA to build the corona spike on a cell. And then our body says that, hey, we don't have those things, so we're going to find something to fight that. And whereas Johnson & Johnson uses a defective viral uh, vector protein to build the same spike. It does the same thing to build the spike, but it works in a different way. Um, and from an ivory tower medical standpoint, that makes sense. We treat 
heart disease, we treat blood pressure different ways. In blood pressure, we use things that decrease our volume, decrease our heart rate so it decreases the work on the system, lowers the resistance in our veins so that it decreases the pressure. So maybe using two different vaccine makeups, our antibodies would be built a little bit different inside. That does make sense, but it's not recommended. We can't do that. I won't take money for it. Golf balls, maybe. No money. Uh, one of the other things is that um, there are several countries that are already doing booster shots. Bahrain, United Arab Emirates, Germany, Israel, and France are doing um, booster shots. Now, Israel is doing just a small subset population, only those people over 65. France is only doing a small subset of people, people who live in group homes. Um, but the other countries are anybody who wants a third shot can come and get it. Uh, and again, they are asking not to do that. Uh, they're asking that we send vaccine, and the United States has done a good job in that. We've sent over 2 billion vaccines to underprivileged countries to get them vaccinated. But there are countries out there that have a 2% vaccination rate. So as we open up our travel, as we open up our borders um, all, worldwide, people who are traveling could be bringing in a different variant. Uh, it's interesting that about 400 colleges in the United States are requiring their students to get vaccinated and their staff to get vaccinated. Federal civilian employees are required to get vaccinated. If they refuse to get vaccinated, that's okay. They can't be fired by the labor laws, but they say that they can, um, they have to wear masks, that the, your employer can make them wear masks. They can make them uh, stay six feet apart from everybody else, and they can make them do regular COVID testing. Now, I looked up what regular COVID testing meant, and the CDC's recommendations is every two weeks. So as we said earlier, before we started filming, that that's kind of a pain in the butt. They're kind of pushing people to go get the vaccine, which I believe in the vaccine, so that's okay for me. Um, so that's, those are the things that happen with, uh, with the CDC. I did put a slide in here uh, about those questions. Now I'd like to open it up for any other questions. Does anybody else have questions about there? Yes, Carl. I got here. There will be. Uh, anyway, uh, testimonial first. I got my Moderna shot down at the Big Y uh, pharmacy, and Eddie gave it to me. And he's the kindest general shot <laughs> of all the ones in the Army or other places in all my I, 39 years. I just didn't want to cry, and I ran out of lollipops. Hey, I forgot my last part there. In all my 39 years. There you go. <laughs> Does anybody else have a question? Yes, ma'am. So if you receive the. Uh, Moderna sh sh uh, shot early because you're elderly, should you be getting a booster shot? That's a great question. Moderna is actually not pushing for anybody to get booster shots right now. They're really working on um, studying younger children. They're, the consensus is, are we going to just booster everybody else? We have a choice. We booster everybody in the country, or do we vaccinate younger people because as we know children are little petri dishes in this world um, so they carry all kinds of things and kids normally don't get violently ill and they don't get seriously ill from having the covid virus but they can pass it to somebody else and that was when we were first in the covid throes in january february march that was the biggest concern. Our families have grown. We don't have just one generational families anymore. So if a child goes to school and brings home a virus and their grandparent lives with them, they have a chance of infecting them and they can be more serious. Should you get another booster, the CDC is saying no, they, they're not going to do that. The World Health Organization is saying no, they're not going to do that. Pfizer is the one that is pushing for people who were vaccinated in December of 2020, January, and February of this year, that they think that they may need the booster. If you talk about the nine-month coverage, you're about that now. So that's, I think, why they're talking about that. The cynical Eddie that's on the other side of the, me here says that Pfizer just has a whole lot of vaccine they'd like to have the government buy for them. I, I didn't get to the question. I didn't give him my question. No, you didn't, because you <laughs> remembered 39 years. Uh, right, okay. Uh, last week, I guess, I think you get jiggy with so much on the TV. Everything's COVID, COVID, and Delta. And I, for about three days there, I was cold in the afternoon. I had to put my flannel shirt on. And I wondered about, you know, am I getting sick or something like that? And so I guess you answered my question already about uh, stay home and uh, 
I took my temperature. The temperature was low. That's that's what you really want to worry about is is your fever. You will get it. You will get a temperature. So that's the thing that you want to worry about. The I think that we have had a ton of fluctuation in our weather patterns, and I know that allergies are super high this time of the year. It's ridiculous. So that could have been part of it. Um, but if you have a fever, if you're coughing, sneezing, and it's not from allergies because people are sneezing from allergies, I belong to that group, um, then you should just stay home, call your doctor if you think, Tylenol, ibuprofen, that kind of thing will help. Yes, ma'am. If you have had COVID, um, I've heard complaints, people don't want to get the vaccine because they have antibodies that will last six to nine months. So I don't know how to answer their question. Great, great question. Um, I answer that question with yes, get the vaccine. But that's true. Uh, and it's true in another part of the adverse event part as well. If you've had COVID and you had a case where it puts you in bed for a day or longer, then yes, you have your antibodies for six to nine months. So you're protected from getting it. You're protected from passing it um, less than 80%, about 14% to somebody else. But your body hasn't built the antibodies specifically to what the vaccine is for. So you should get it. The problem with that is if you've seen most of the, the side effects, the adverse effects that happened from the Moderna shot happened after, on the second shot, where 10 or 12 hours later, and even with the Pfizer shot as well, 10 or 12 hours later, you get a headache. Um, the next day, you don't feel like really doing much but watching uh, Tom Selleck reruns or something. So that's very true. Now, if you've had COVID and you were in bed for a day or two, and then you got the first shot, you're probably going to get that reaction after the first shot. The second shot will be more normal. And unfortunately, by virtue of you ladies out there that only have X chromosomes, you have more of that side effect than the men do. And those things happened in men versus women. They actually did a study out in uh, Stanford, I believe it was. It was out west somewhere. Um, it's on one of my other cards. I don't want to dig it out. Uh, but they did a study of giving women progesterone uh, supplementation after the second shot to see if that would help, and it, it, it didn't have any link to it. They tried to link the Johnson & Johnson serious side effects of the blood clots they had, and just to clear that up, that was eight people of the three, first three million shots given, um, and they were serious. There were seven, eight people hospitalized. One person did die, uh, and they tried to link that to um, exogenous estrogen therapy, so either oral contraceptives because they used the age group of 18 to 49, so either oral contraceptives or estrogen replacement therapy, hormone replacement therapy uh, in that regard. Yes, sure. Um, the um, COVID vaccine, or, I'm sorry, the COVID test, mm -hmm. there's a quick test, a fast test or whatever it is, and then there's another test. Are the results any different? That's a good question as well. There are three different COVID tests. The antigen test is normally your quick test. And that shows that you have part of the COVID virus in your body. Is it a viable part? They don't know yet. The PCR test, the polymerase chain reaction test, which is the one that takes uh, eight to 12 hours for them to do, that one is to show if you have active, viable COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 virus in your system. And then there's an antibody test. And that one shows whether you've come in contact with a high enough level of the virus to build antibodies to it. Um, at our pharmacy, we have two of them. We have the antigen test, which is a quick test. It's like $25 for two different tests. Uh, normally what happens with those, if you test it, if you're positive, you wait three or four days, test again, and if you're, you, you'll probably be negative by that point if the virus is just floating through, you know, like it's visiting. You went to Washington, you went to Florida, and you stopped at Washington to look at the cherry blossoms in May, and then you drove on, so it's kind of like that. The virus came into your system somehow. You, you've seen it somewhere, um, so that could be what they do. And then the antibody test that we have is something by prescription only through Physician 360. You do a consultation with them, and then they send a prescription for that. And then you take that home. That's a saliva test. You mail it away. You get the results in two days. Um, just regarding the, the quick test, 
best um, if you are having company um, and if you want to make sure people that are not vaccinated have a COVID test uh, would a quick test be sufficient enough to Absolutely. to answer the, the answer to that question is yes. The quick test is the one that they use for those situations. Um, I don't think the quick test is enough when you're traveling outside the country. I think the quick test is enough for some states. Um, but unfortunately, if you look at the map for new COVID infections by area, the states that allow the quick test as a viable test to see if you have COVID, are the ones in the dark maroon where they have the most new cases every day. That's Nevada, Florida, Tennessee. Those are the ones. Yes, sir. Uh, so many people not taking the test. Not taking the test or the shot? The shot, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, back when the uh, polio went around and the South Park vaccine came in, I assume everybody must, must have taken that. I, I'm not sure about that, Carl. That was, uh, I think, three or four weeks before I was born. It might have been in 1929, right? 1935. So that, that, was, that was a while ago. I don't know what they can mandate and what they can't. I would bet you back then um, America was young um, and America was the place of freedom and we got to choose what we wanted to do. Polio has been eradicated as a, as a pathogen for, um, for a pandemic and an epidemic, yes. Uh, are there still polio vaccine available? There are. They're not oral. They're not shots anymore. But they don't force people coming into our country to get them, Carl. So it could happen uh, just as a, a, a small bird walk. Uh, Linda, my wife, likes to say I take long bird walks, but this is a small one. Uh, back in 2016 and 2018, there were two outbreaks, one in Washington State and one in New York State, of measles. Um, and so they had to vaccinate the communities again in measles. Measles has a, a high herd immunity rate similar to, it's actually higher than COVID. It's 89 to 92%. So those vaccination rates in the communities went down to 75% and they had an outbreak. It didn't reach pan epidemic levels and it didn't reach pandemic levels, but they did have outbreaks in those communities. Yes, ma'am. I have a granddaughter who is expecting shortly and the discussion has been whether or not she would get an, a vaccination after she has the baby and she is going to go back to teaching school also. Okay, if she's going back to teaching school, she probably doesn't have a choice. She probably has to get the COVID vaccine. Um, they recommended pregnant women get the COVID vaccine when, when they were pregnant. Um, the really important vaccine for you is the Tdap vaccine. I don't know if you're up to date on that. You should check on that because that has whooping cough in it. And by the influx of immigrants that are not um, vaccinated against whooping cough, we've had Cases of that in children are very susceptible. So that's something you have to worry about. But going back to the COVID-19 vaccination, um, she should get the vaccine. I, I am a proponent of vaccination. I believe in herd immunity. Um, and if she's a school teacher, if it's a private school, she can be terminated if she doesn't get her vaccine. If it's a public school, she can be put on desk duty and not teach. So um, mo in, in most states. So she probably will have to go back and get her shot if she's a public school teacher. Yes, ma'am. The Tdap shot. Do you have to get that more than once? The question was, do you have to get the Tdap shot more than once? Uh, you have to get it every 10 years is the protocol. Now, you can double up on that one. There are certain shots you sh couldn't double up on if we're going to, we'll take a bird walk to the left here now for vaccines. Um, the, you can double up on that one. That's not a big deal. Tetanus, you can get, you're supposed to get every 10 years. That's okay. You can get multiple flu vaccines, which you don't want to, but you can. Uh, pneumonia vaccines are the ones you can't. So you don't want to get multiple pneumonia vaccines. You have to follow the protocol for that. The protocol changed last year. The protocol prior to last year was that 
There are two vaccines. It's a Prevnar 13, which is a conjugated vaccine. That's a once in a lifetime shot. You get that first. And then a year later, 12 months later, you get the Pneumovax 23, which is a 23 strain pneumonia vaccine. And that one's in every 10 year uh, protocol. But they've changed that because they found that after doing their studies, which they do as time goes on, the Prevnar 13 didn't really build the antibodies they thought it would. So the new protocol is you get the pneumonia 23, the Prevnar, the, the pneumo, the new immune 23, uh, which you do every 10 years, and then a year later, if you think you want it and you think your doctor wants it, then you can get the Prevnar 13. And those are for 65 and above. The shingle shot, um, since we'll take a little side path off that bird trail, the shingle shot is for 50 and above, and there are two shots. Protocol is first shot, second shot, between two to six months later. Thank you so much for your attendance. Thank you for being here. It's so great to be out in public again. Debbie, thank you again very much.